Okay, we are starting. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to our third webinar as part of the Pharmaceutical Mini Academy TPA Global is proud to host and welcome again. Uh, this time we'll be discussing the topic of can you leverage from a purchase price allocation in the context of transfer pricing. Um, I will now introduce very shortly uh, the speakers. Uh, we have uh, Johanna, which is Associate at Transfer Pricing Associates in Amsterdam. She graduated from the Rotterdam School of Management, Erasmus, famous Erasmus University. And she is a valuation and transfer pricing specialist who worked for me in a large pharmaceutical project within the TPA group. Uh, thank you, Johanna. We have Igor Soroka, a senior manager at Twister, uh, who I do hope uh, is with us right now or will join as we move on. Uh, Igor is a senior manager who has worked in the transfer pricing field since 2006 and has been involved in preparing transfer pricing documentation and providing audit defense support to buyer clients in pharmaceutical but also in other transfer pricing fields. And me, uh, Yariv, I'm a founding partner at uh, Bartzvi and Bendo Law Offices, which is an uh, Israeli alliance uh, of the Transfer Pricing Associate Group. Uh, and we are representing more than 200 clients worldwide in the transfer pricing field, including many pharmaceutical giants around the world. Um, and let's start. Let's move to the next slide, please. So just that will be in the right uh, uh, content here, uh, let's go quickly of what we've done so far and what we are planned to be uh, to do in the future. So the first webinar was dealing with the pharmaceutical uh, patent cliff. We discussed all the, the, the uh, uh, number of NDA that uh, proved that went down from 31 uh, to 19 in the 19s, and we saw that the patent cliff is the big threat on pharmaceutical ethical companies nowadays. Uh, we experienced what will be in the future, how to uh, deal with these tactics, whether you're a generic company or an ethic, uh, ethical uh, pharmaceutical company, and we also talked about, uh, about return on R&D investment royalty, uh, cost of goods sold in the context of transfer pricing, uh, webinar number two uh, dealt with the structuring of in-licensed IPR, um, and we discussed how to build the ideal pipeline, and we asked the question, should the multinationals in the pharmaceutical industry resort to in-licensed R&D from specialty shops and university, whether to do it within the group, what are the price pricing consequences, how to deal, for example, uh, with... Uh, uh, contract manufacturing and other uh, licensing uh, uh, issues when we saw that multinationals seem to prefer the creation of central side IP ops or principal structure. Today, we will discuss about uh, uh, the leverage from a purchase price allocation, also known as PPA, um, for transfer pricing purposes. And our next webinar will actually analyze the economics of the pipeline in the pharmaceutical industry and this, by the way, would be kind of a um, uh, direct continuity from this current webinar when we'll discuss a couple of uh, valuation methods for the pharmaceutical industry, the DCF versus the real option valuation model, model but we will be discussing a special DCF for pharmaceuticals, so I encourage everybody to uh, participate. So uh, today uh, we will discuss uh, about the PPA for transfer pricing uh, uh, purposes, and uh, we're actually going to see whether PPA um, is something we can use also uh, for uh, uh, transfer pricing. And uh, uh, following an acquisition, the purchase price by it must be allocated, as we know, for all identical assets and liabilities assumed. And we will touch all accounting issues versus transfer pricing, especially with the term of uh, goodwill. And in the end of this webinar, we will be able uh, to see uh, whether transfer pricing and uh, financial reporting purposes are working together, maybe they're not, and what uh, you should do.
So um, thank you again for joining us. And Johanna, please uh, take over for the next slide. Thank you very much, Yari. Uh, so, yes, first of all, uh, I would like to start with providing a small introduction regarding the purchase price, price allocation. So, basically, following an acquisition, the purchase price, which is basically the transaction price, will need to be allocated to the assets acquired and the liabilities assumed at fair value. And this needs to be done on the acquisition date. Now, this exercise will be performed irrespective of whether the transaction is structured as an asset or a stock. Now, the purchase price allocation comprises uh, the purchase price uh, overall comprises of the value of cash and stock consideration, plus any payments which will be made to the target's employees for services that were performed uh, in the past uh, and for which no benefits are expected to be derived. So basically we need to cover all assumed uh, liabilities, such as severance payments or maybe stock options that will vest upon the change of control. So, as you can see on the right side of this slide, the starting point for a purchase price allocation is always the book value of the net assets. And this is basically the book value of the shareholder's equity. Now, on top of that, we need to value all identifiable assets and adjust them at a fair value. When we talk about all identifiable assets, we mean uh, property, plan, and equipment, as well as all uh, intangibles that meet the, the uh, criteria to be identified according to IAS 38. Now, what is left uh, after we allocate these values is considered goodwill, and it usually includes uh, a premium for control, any synergies, or any in process R&D. So we can move to the next slide. So basically, uh, now we're going to discuss how the purchase price allocation can be relevant uh, for a transfer pricing analysis. Overall, there is um, a wide range of opinions regarding this issue. Uh, others state that a purchase price allocation can be relevant for a transfer pricing analysis, especially if a transfer pricing analysis takes place uh, close to the time when the purchase price allocation was performed. On the other hand, however, if we look at the discussion draft on intangibles, the revised discussion draft, which was issued by the OECD on July 2013, uh, there we can see that uh, what is mentioned is that caution and careful consideration should be uh, given to the underlying assumptions on evaluation study. Uh, in this uh, slide, we, we do summarize the three uh, considerations that we're going to discuss. So we're going to discuss the differences in the value standard that is be being used for a purchase price allocation versus uh, a transfer pricing analysis. Then we're going to look at some uh, differences, methodological differences in the valuation, and uh, we're going to discuss the categories of intangibles uh, for uh, transfer pricing purposes versus reporting purposes. We can move to the next slide. Yeah. So we're going to start with the first uh, difference, which is the value standard. So IFRS 13 uh, includes the fair value measurement, and it basically mentions that this is the standard that should be uh, used. This um, uh, IFRS 13 is effective as of the 1st of January 2013. Uh, on the other hand, for the purpose of a transfer pricing analysis, uh, the transactions need to be uh, in line with the arm's length principle. There are a number of elements uh, in IFRS 13 uh, which contain certain, certain analogies uh, with uh, the arm's length principle. The first one is basically that the fair value measurement considers the concept of the highest and the best use. Now, there are similarities between this notion and what is basically mentioned in the OECD transfer pricing guidelines, that independent parties should exploit all options that are realistically available. Uh, the second thing that is quite common is uh, the fair value hierarchy that defines three levels of inputs, uh, which should be considered, and gives a priority, basically, uh, to um, a certain uh, in certain quality of data. So basically what the hierarchy describes is that we should 
uh, have certain quality of inputs to come to a reliable fair value measurement. In a similar way, the OECD guidelines require that uh, one um, ensures a sufficient level of reliability in the comparability data. In the comparable data, sorry. Uh, now, overall, the hierarchy uh, gives the highest priority to unadjusted quad prices in active markets for identical assets and liabilities. Now, this methodology is quite similar to uh, the transfer pricing method, the COP method, the comparable, un, uh, the comparable uncontrolled price method. The second level of input includes inputs which are others than the ones that are included in, at level one, that are quoted market prices observable for the assets or liabilities, either directly or indirectly. And at the end, we have the third level of inputs, which is basically unobservable uh, inputs for the assets and the liabilities. With respect to valuation methods, uh, the OECD um, considers those as useful tools which can be part of one of the OECD uh, approved methods. For example, usually the income approach is considered as a, a useful uh, technique that may be used in a profit split method, or it can be used standalone as an alternative or other method uh, which might give an arm's length price. We may move to the next slide. Now this slide provides an overview of what we just explained regarding the fair value hierarchy. Uh, as you can see, this slide summarizes the fact that the first point of reference should be the market approach because we give priority to quoted market prices in an active market, uh, which will provide the most reliable estimate for a fair value. Now, if we cannot find these prices, then we would move to an income approach. Now, the cost approach is uh, considered applicable only if the prerequisites of either the market approach or the income approach can be met. So we can move to the next slide. Now, regarding some uh, methodological differences, uh, valuations performed for transfer pricing purposes um, need to reflect both the legal and the economic ownership of the assets within the specific legal entity that holds them. However, when a purchase price location is done for financial reporting purposes, uh, these studies may be performed on a consolidated basis, and as such, uh, the legal ownership of each intangible may not be considered. Now, intangible asset valuations prepared for financial reporting uh, purposes are generally performed at the, um, at, at the reporting units. So a reporting unit may be organized based on products, geograph geographies, or other criteria, and this may present some basic differences with a legal entity level which is applicable for a transfer pricing study. Now, uh, if we move to uh, the goodwill, basically what we're going to see in... Uh, no, we need to go back to the previous slide, sorry. Um, for, for transfer pricing purposes, basically, uh, the, the definition of goodwill is quite different than the one that is used for financial reporting purposes. Because as we mentioned in the first slide, for financial reporting purposes, goodwill is considered something like the residual, whereas for transfer pricing purposes, there are some items which are included in goodwill which may require a separate compensation, such, for, such as um, synergies or in-process R&Ds, and those elements will need to be separated from, uh, from goodwill and, and, and uh, they need to be uh, considered separately. With respect to the tax amortization benefit, for financial reporting purposes, uh, you need to account it in all situations, whereas in the case of uh, transfer pricing, it is solely accounted when it's tax deductible. So uh, now we move to the next slide, and I think this is the slide where Igor is supposed to take over. Igor, are you there? <laughs> 
No, unfortunately, uh, Igor is uh, having probably a few technical problems, so I guess, Joanna, you can continue and I will uh, dig in also. Okay. I think he's in. in. Yes. Igor? Oh? Yes. We have Igor on the line. Oh, oh we're glad to have you, Igor. So, Igor. Um, Please continue uh, to have uh, the characterizer of intangible for reporting and concept writing purposes. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes, excellent. Okay, great. Sorry for the technical uh, difficulties. I apologize. Um, so uh, this slide deals with the definition of intangibles for uh, transfer pricing and for reporting purposes. Um, so as mentioned, um, in uh, IAS 38, uh, first we have to really understand that the uh, intangible asset, it has to be identifiable non-monetary asset. So first of all, it has to be an asset, which is very difficult, different from the definition of an intangible under uh, transfer pricing uh, guidelines, uh, OECD guidelines. So here we have um, for IS38, it has, like, an asset is a resource that is controlled by the entity as a result of past events and for which future economic benefits are expected. So this is very important because you first have to have an asset in order to be even considering whether you have an intangible or tangible asset. Where if you look at the definition for transfer pricing purposes, it's really just a something. So it's something which is not a physical asset or financial asset, which is capable of being owned or controlled for use in commercial activities and whose use or transfer would be compensated had it occurred in transaction between in independent parties in comparable circumstances. So, so the different, different recognition criteria for I, under IS 38 and OECD uh, Chapter 6 discussion draft makes it very different for um, accounting purposes and for transfer pricing purposes. The biggest distinction being that for transfer pricing purposes, the definition is much wider and it can capture really uh, all types of um, intangibles even when it's not considered to be an asset. It's really broader definition. It's, it's, uh, does, you don't have to have a legal control over an asset. Uh, it can be, you can be an economic owner of, of an asset, and that, that would still be considered an intangible for transfer pricing purposes, whereas under accounting purposes, you would need to have some, uh, it either would have to be separable or arise from contractual or other legal rights. Um, let's uh, move on to the next slide, which will show in, in a case study the differences between characterization of intangibles. So um, this is a situation where um, deals with the different treatment of intangible for accounting, transfer pricing, and tax purposes. So consider a French parent company that made an acquisition of a Belgium operating company, which is uh, a pharmaceutical distributor. So under the uh, transfer pricing principles, uh, the operating company is um, earning operating margin of 2%. That includes the year-end adjustment. And for accounting purposes, uh, following the acquisition, all of the goodwill of acquired assets is booked in parent company under IFRS. So um, in our ca case, Belgium operating company has developed some uh, unique marketing intangibles. For example, the ability to timely secure the registration to get the market access, or it has well-trained sales force that allows it to surpass its sales target. Uh, and the question here is, would this marketing intangibles be uh, it, like how would uh, how, how does the purchase price allocation of the required marketing intangibles influence the, the transfer pricing system? Meaning that uh, if this uh, marketing intangibles are not identifiable intangibles under IS 38, however, for transfer pricing purposes, you should consider these intangibles because they will fall in the definition of something which is, which is not an asset, but still it's something that, uh, that you, would, um, you would consider and it would provide future, like benefit and, and would be considered an intangible for transfer pricing purposes. So, um, so, so this is a very interesting, interesting question where you have the intangible itself being included in goodwill in parent company because it's for accounting purposes in goodwill. Now, for transfer pricing purposes, it is an intangible. Now, the question becomes, how do we, um, how do we give return to that intangible under the OECD guidelines? So here is what's important to understand is uh, what 
first what methodology is used, and here we use the t transactional net margin method with the operating margin. And the second question is what comparables are used to benchmark the operating company. So if the comparables themselves have these types of intangible, uh, then in this case no additional remuneration would be required for the operating company. However, if there is, um, if this operating company has some very valuable, unique intangibles that uh, that your comparables wouldn't have, then you would need to 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 have that um, separate remuneration for for those marketing intangibles in the operating core, even though the the actual intangible for accounting purposes is booked in goodwill in the parent company. And then finally, for tax purposes, the question arises whether you would be able to take tax amortization for this type of intangible, and that's something that would be looked at on a country-by-country -country basis, and it would depend on a tax law in, uh, in each jurisdiction. Can we move on to the next slide? So this uh, this case is, is really just a continuation of, of the previous one. Um, in this situation, uh, we have a parent company that, that following the acquisition, decides to transfer a number of its valuable employees to the operating company. And the question is, can this transfer result in a, in a transfer of know-how? Um, so this is really coming from, from the recent uh, discussion draft, uh, OEC discussion draft on, uh, on intangibles, where they made it very clear that uh, transfer of an employee may result in a transfer of know-how. Um, personally, I don't believe this should be the case as uh, parent co does not own or control its employees. Um, therefore, it's not really cannot really transfer an intangible, which is a know-how that it doesn't not own or control, which is uh, which is the definition of intangible under the OECD guidelines. Um, but uh, that's that's the position the OECD has been taking now, and we've actually made a representation on this topic to the OECD. Uh, if you want more details on that, you can check Richter's submission to the OECD's revised draft on intangible. But uh, all to say is if the current wording of the revised Chapter 6 stays as is, then we should be concerned with any transfers of, of employees that may potentially result in a transfer of know-how. So assume this is the case and uh, you determine that this employee do possess some valuable know-how, and based on the current wording of the OECD guidelines, the transfer results in, in the transfer of know-how, then there are quite a few questions that you must address. Um, first is how you would determine the value of this know-how. And uh, this, this obviously could be done using some valuation techniques such as DCF. But what's more difficult here is how you would even uh, reflect that transfer for accounting and, and tax purposes. So going back to the definition of intangible under IS 38, this know-how would probably not consider it even as an asset, never mind an intangible asset, as it's not controlled by the entity, and it would be difficult to demonstrate the future economic benefits from this know-how. So for accounting purposes, it would be a non-event, and now since for transfer pricing purposes it's considered an intangible, which is being transferred, then there must be an arms like a consideration for this intangible. And then the question arises is how, you, how do you book this remuneration for accounting purposes if you have not really disposed of anything, but you yet you received remuneration for this know-how? So does that mean that the goodwill in the parent company now is diminished by the value of this know-how? Or does that mean that you should record it as a contributed surplus in the retained earnings? Um, and then finally, what do you do for tax purposes? Can you, um, can you take a tax amortization for this know-how? So again, this is, this is the case where it, it's, um, it, it looks like a simple situation where you just transfer an employee, um, but then so many issues can arise from, from this situation. And again, it's all because of the wording of the revised Chapter 6 on intangibles. Um, if you can move to the next slide, it's, uh, it provides um, a, a brief summary of, uh, of all consideration for the transfer of know-how. So first issue is, is it even an intangible asset? And then uh, for accounting, tax and transfer pricing is a different treatment, as we discussed, not for accounting, but most likely would be, uh, it would be an intangible for transfer pricing as well as for tax purposes. Again, how will it be recognized? So no recognition on accounting. For transfer pricing purposes, you would have to reflect it in, in relevant information returns, transfer pricing documentation, uh, and for tax purposes, you would have uh, income inclusion or deduction or uh, amortiz tax amortization. Again, it all depends on the country-specific tax law. 
and um, and the consequences of this of this is again no consequences on accounting side, but there are consequences on tax and transfer pricing side. Um, Yariv, Joanna, do you have anything to add? Not from my side, Yariv. Uh, Igor. I will uh, take it uh, probably from there, and we'll see another case studies that fits exactly to the table you just uh, demonstrate, and then uh, uh, we will see how this transfer pricing and PPA combines uh, together. Uh, Joanna, any comments to that? Not at this stage. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Of course, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, when we are talking about uh, know-how, that's one of the questions we received online right now, and I encourage everybody, if uh, you have any question, uh, to pop them in, and we will be glad to answer during and after, of course, uh, we finish. We talk about know-how of a certain uh, process. Uh, for example, uh, when we are providing license to manufacture and sell uh, to our related parties, so we are providing actually the know-how uh, process, how, how to do it, and for that, we need a certain remuneration. So this is regarding uh, what we call the know-how. Uh, we discussed this very. Uh, 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 we discussed this in our previous webinar when we talked about an uh, in license uh, IPR. So we will uh, uh, continue. So uh, as Johanna started and Igor mentioned, uh, we have uh, different value standards uh, from IRS. Section 482, which all of us know, of course, are the transfer pricing regulation of uh, the United States, uh, the, which is the arm length standard versus the IFRS, for example, fair market value, and also the reconciliation between the value reached under the arm length principle and the fair uh, market value. Uh, after uh, we finish uh, with the, all these slides, I will give a, a summary of what we discussed and mainly concentrate on that difference because I think also the OECD um, will also uh, cannot ignore this difference when the IRS is mentioning that. So uh, in this uh, uh, slide, when we see the U.S. Pharma target and the acquire and the principal, I would say that in the end for accounting purposes, as we can see, there is already a business value and goodwill with, which Joanna and Igor mentioned a couple of times, this is the main issue of our presentation. Goodwill represents actually the difference between the purchase price and the assets that the appraiser can or is allowed to value. Some of the reason for there being a difference, I would say, depend on assumptions that the appraiser makes on inputs like the discount rate and useful life and the WAC, which is, of course, the important factor, the weighted average cost of capital in any valuation that we're doing, also the period of time for forecasts over which to value, etc. And one main argument for not depending on goodwill value is that this is not how to unassociated enterprises would act if we're going back to the arm length standard, the arm length principle, transfer pricing, most likely, two unassociated enterprises would use valuation techniques such as DCF, which we, of course, discuss in our next webinar, to value intangibles. But what we can say is that what unassociated enterprises definitely would not do is to evaluate the underlying assets or the ongoing business separately and then add a value for goodwill in order to reach the fair market value of the business. So this is the conflict we are dealing with, and please, if we can move to the next slide, please. Okay, so we see here a parent company which holds an operating company in Belgium. We see the pharmaceutical distributor operating margin 5%. That uh, resembles your example, Igor, of the 2%, including the year end adjustment. This is the things we are used to see uh, in the distributor um, uh, being a lower distributor ranges using the TNMM or the CPM, which is basically more or less a uh, uh, thing in the, in the United States. And, and the question are, does the fact that Goodwill represents half of the value of the distributor suggest that the distributor has some intangibles that should be considered for transfer pricing purposes? Um, let's let's uh, remember, 
that uh, when we're doing the purchasing price allocation, the TPA, that again is done for accounting purposes. And if we see that goodwill in this example represents for the PPA 50% of the value of the distributor, so we are guessing uh, that this distributor has unique intangible that must be analyzed for transfer pricing purposes because if it was just a lower risk distributor, uh, 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 entitled for a 5% operating margin. So why we have 50% goodwill, what this number has come from? Because the PPA that was done for accounting purposes now question the validity of the characterization of operating company as a simple distributor. And let's assume this uh, distributor it has intangible, and we want to check the value we can use for the residual analysis. So we can, of course, use a regular DCF, and again, we will discuss it in, the, in, uh, in our uh, next uh, webinar. Uh, and DCF is based on projection by the company and deduct the routine return of this, uh, for example, low risk distributor. Um, of course, there is a need an assumption that they are intangible and that 3% is a routine return. And to determine the present value, the PV of intangible, we can then uh, discount all excess free cash flow and see what is the results. Or, or we can check the excess return from sales and figure out the royalty rate if there is indeed a case for royalty rate. And the point is that there are several alternatives to determine the value of intangible of the distributor versus the goodwill. But... Um, as you can see, there is a different approach for PPA and uh, for transfer pricing uh, purposes. Uh, let's move to the next slide, please. Okay, now we have a company in the U.S., and, you know, it says their tax rate is 35%. We all know that sometimes it's also 30% um, federal uh, income, you know, whatever you look at it. And holding a company in Ireland when, you know, this is just a number 12.5%, it could be even lower. We were presented in TPA, Transfer Pricing Associated, many pharmaceutical companies, and we faced even lower jurisdictions tax rate than 12.5%. So, uh, again, uh, for the merger and the acquisition, we, we look at the PPA results and we have tangible assets of 30%. We have customer relationship 20%, and the manufacturing process know-how 30%, and again, the good old goodwill of 10%. And the question is, again, what should be the transfer pricing model considering the intangibles owned by this operating company in Ireland? Um, should operating company in Ireland will be characterized as a full-fledged manufacturer or maybe a contract manufacturer? Um, I guess that the incentive here is to keep most of the profits in Ireland, you know, as we can see. So uh, alternative number one would be not to extract IP out of Ireland, or in other words, to keep it as a full-fledged manufacturer to earn maximum profits. Um, of course, if the U.S. is the main market, then the U.S. entity can act in this particular segment transaction as a pharmaceutical distributor and earn, again, the routine profit using the CPM method. Um, if we go to the contract manufacturing model, when Ireland will be characterized as a contract manufacturing, then um, we will need to evaluate what are we going to do with that. One alternative maybe to be is to sell the IP from uh, Ireland uh, to the U.S. And uh, the same thinking here. You know, we need to evaluate in the IP. And again, most likely to do a residual uh, uh, DCF. Um, what, all, what else we can say about that is that we can see again the different objective, you know, the multinational have because we have faced a lot of cases like this and I'm sure all our attendees, attendees also face that. Um, if again the objective is to maximize profits in Ireland and minimize the tax, then you want it, Ireland to be a full-fledged manufacturer. Uh, but sometimes we also want to centralize the IP, uh, like IP hubs or centralize IP. Again, we discussed this in our previous webinar, like in the parent company or some other jurisdictions. So I guess what's important here 
is what intangible would Ireland have to dispose in the end, and can the PPA value be used for transfer pricing uh, uh, purposes? This is what I think uh, right now. All right, uh, let's move on to the next slide. And actually, this slide is not a very impressive slide. It's also just saying that we are now uh, ready to hear if there's any Q&A. And again, you are welcome uh, to use uh, our uh, interactive uh, web event to send a question. We will be happy uh, to answer. While you're doing that, um, let me just summarize. Uh, I wrote for, you know, a little summary for all of that, so I would be happy to share that with you. So, you know, in 2013, which we is about to end uh, these days, uh, a lot of mergers and acquisition uh, took place, and uh, naturally uh, there will be an optic in purchase price allocation (PPA) and the subsequent impairment testing uh, uh, that follows, and all these M&A activities will probably also increase the need for valuation for tax purposes as companies work to integrate the acquired company into their existing legal entity uh, uh, structure. And again, the question is, can we leverage from a PPA to transfer pricing purposes? Can an intangible asset valuation done for financial reporting uh, purposes can be used for transfer pricing uh, uh, purposes? And again, and I think the U.S. regulation from all regulation, and of course OECD today is giving a lot of attention to that and revising its chapters of intangible all the time when we hear that a lot. But I mean, the U.S., uh, which we're knowing about the transfer pricing regulation when the value is determined within transfer pricing framework vary often significantly from the value determining for financial report uh, uh, purposes. And some... Uh, 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 professors today, when we read a lot of articles, even suggested uh, to comment to the OECD, and I think uh, some of them already did that, that goodwill in that essence is not relevant at all to transfer pricing. And we've seen a couple of examples right here then when goodwill was very relevant to PPA because this is the leftover we couldn't characterize of the intangible asset. In transfer pricing, actually, goodwill may also include the value of the acquired assembly, workforce future, and the difference between the consideration paid and the fair value of the identical tangible and intangible uh, is a residual concept. So um, I would say that in the end of the day, um, we need to have uh, evaluation done for financial reporting purposes to perform what we call a double duty for a tax valuation because uh, if we are doing a double duty tax valuation, this is typically leads to unrecognized tax exposure. And this is because the intangible asset valuation performed for transfer pricing purposes often result in higher value than those performed for financial reporting. And we now know why, because right after we got our PPA valuation, in the end of the day, when we are going to transfer pricing valuation, then we are going deep inside and taking part by part and looking what we have there. And if you are looking the arm length standard, then we've got a higher value uh, for the valuation. So our uh, advice uh, to you is that you will prepare to, I would say, to bridge the financial projection and other inputs and assumptions used for each purpose and use a closely coordinated team uh, that one will deal with the PPA, one will deal with transfer pricing, and this is to, uh, as proven in our experience to minimize the effort necessary in creating uh, this bridge. Um, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, if we will have any questions, we will be glad to answer. Let me see if we have them. Again, uh, all attendees, if you have any question, please uh, use uh, the toolbox. Go to chat and pop your question. We will be uh, glad to answer. Uh, by the way, this uh, presentation will go to YouTube, and you can enter that via YouTube or, of course, via our transfer pricing associate at uh, tpa-global.com. Um, Igor, Johanna, any comments? 
Uh, no, I think, uh, Gary, you made a good summary of all these issues addressed, and I guess we have to keep in mind that uh, with the uh, with the way transfer pricing is dealt right now, with the uh, recent uh, revisions of OECD and uh, um, uh, IS 38, uh, as practitioners, we have to make sure that those gaps are are uh, abridged between uh, different. Um, concepts for for valuation and for for transfer pricing uh, purposes. So, so I think it's our, it's our role to 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 discuss this and make sure that um, sort of in the future there would be less of these discrepancies and and hopefully that will, that gap will be bridged. Uh, gentlemen, we do have a question from one of the attendees. Uh, All right. This is, from, this is from Michael Molina. He says regarding case study five. Could the value of the know-how for transfer pricing purposes exceed the total value of accounting goodwill? All right, let's go back to that slide, uh, please, to case study okay, number five. Okay, let me, let me uh, copy that and uh, send it to you, but uh, we'll go back to that slide. Right. Case study right. five. There Igor, we are. do you want to relate to yeah, that? Yeah, I can, I, I, can, I, can, comment. I can speak on that. Um, I think it could be. This, this, it's very possible, uh, although unlikely. But to the extent that uh, the, the techniques used for valuation for transfer pricing purposes are not necessarily the same, that for accounting purposes, I could potentially see that happening. Um, again, this I, I would not see this as, as a likely outcome, given that for uh, even in the OECD revised uh, discussion draft on intangible, it stated that valuation uh, should be used as a starting point. So they will look at the valuation um, techniques and and what is done for accounting purposes. So if the goodwill for accounting purposes represents certain value, and then uh, you would find out that the know-how actually is is represents higher value than all of the goodwill. That I, in my opinion, that would be unlikely. But again, it all depends on the assumptions used to, to produce the valuation and for what purpose that valuation is done. So theoretically, the answer is yes, it could be, but practically, I don't think that would be the case. Yeah, the, I, I agree on uh, on the, that, Icor, and we face a couple of uh, cases like this. Sometimes I can al also say that when dealing, uh, especially with the U.S. Uh, uh, related parties with European companies or rest of the world, uh, we are also facing some surprises when uh, you know we get a totally different result for transfer pricing purposes, especially uh, uh, when doing uh, 4A2 analyze uh, versus what have done in the PPA. So I totally agree with that. Do we have any more questions? Not at this stage. Okay, so I would like to thank everybody who uh, uh, were with us, uh, was with us in this uh, seminar. Um, uh, again, this will be also on uh, YouTube, and we are welcome to get into our uh, website of Transfer Pricing Associate. Um, and I will hope to see all of you, or actually uh, or be online with all of you on our next webinar that will deal with the DCF versus real option valuation model, especially for the pharmaceutical, and an announcement of the specific date and time and everything will be published, of course. Thank you very much. We'd like to thank all of our global attendees for attending the Transfer Pricing Webinar, and we'll keep you updated as to when this will be posted online. And if you do have any additional questions, you may send them to the emails on your screen at the moment, and we look forward to webinaring with you once again. Have a good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are. This is Transfer Pricing Associates in Amsterdam, wishing you a very good day. Bye-bye.